Okay, we're ready to get started. If people could take a seat. So uh, welcome to our morning panel um, where we're going to discuss uh, different issues um, in the use of online media, both in academia and in business. Um, we certainly um, have seen a lot of challenges. I mean, our panel couldn't, uh, the news couldn't uh, better prepare us for our panel. We've seen challenges in a number of different ways. So, but what we want to talk about here are both uh, the challenges that different sectors face, um, the benefits, uh, nonetheless, that um, people can make of making use of uh, digital media, and then uh, we've, our panel includes people both from industry and academia, and so we also want to talk about um, collaboration between industry and academia. So we're going to start with introductions. So, Guru. Good morning, and I'm Kathy. Thank you very much for having me over here. Um, my name is Guru Banavar. I uh, was formerly the uh, VP of uh, AI at IBM Research, so I met a lot of you in my role. Uh, at IBM, um, but about a year ago, um, I uh, moved on and uh, started a new company along with a bunch of co-founders. Uh, the company is called Viome. Um, we are in the omics business, um, so we get uh, microbiome transcriptomes from consumers. Um, we get samples from them, which we run through a lab. We get um, their metabolome, their transcriptome of the microbiome, um, also other kinds of human uh, omics data, and we put it all together using AI and machine learning, and we come back to you as a consumer with recommendations for ongoing good health and wellness uh, for food, with supplements, with lifestyle changes, and so forth. And uh, it's been a it's been a year since we started that. Uh, there's you know the, the the reason why this is such an exciting field is because there's new biology, systems biology that we're taking advantage of. There's new technologies, lab technologies, and um, information technologies. There's new kinds of interventions that have all come, come around in the last uh, couple of years, few years. Everything is kind of coming together to the point where I think we can really make a difference to the health and wellness of um, the entire world. So that's why I'm excited about Thank you. Okay, Alfred? So I'm Alfred Spector. Uh, I am currently the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Engineering at a firm named Two Sigma. Two Sigma uh, is aimed at organizing and utilizing lots of financial data to optimize uh, many diverse economic outcomes. Our thesis is that if there's a lot of data around and you can draw valuable conclusions, you can do a better job at helping the world set prices, inventories, do transactions more efficiently. Uh, we're known um, for initially being a hedge fund, uh, and that is about maybe two-thirds of, uh, of the employees and a lot of the focus of the firm. Uh, we also do other things in finance. For example, we now have uh, getting close to 100 people looking at how to apply data to do a much more efficient job in insurance and in, in business insurance, thinking we can make the transactions to get insurance and process insurance uh, much more efficient than they are today, and also do a better job of, say, reflecting risk back to the people who might incur the risk, and if they understand the risk, they can work to mitigate it, benefiting everyone uh, in the world. Um, my background has been as a, uh, mostly as a research leader. I was head of research at Google. I worked very closely with Corinna, which was a delight for about eight years, and before that I was uh, actually head of uh, software research for IBM when I met Guru. So I see a lot of the, w the issues that we have with data science or artificial intelligence from multiple perspectives. I guess we have a chance to give a statement on that at some point, and I will uh, discuss that and how that relates to Two Sigma Next. Hi, I'm Henry Kautz from University of Rochester. I founded, the, I'm the founding director of the Gergen Institute for Data Science at the university. I've been uh, very involved in AI research for, for many years, in particular AI research for public good, uh, such as uh, public health. And um, I also am, am currently a chair of the section on information and computing for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and just to uh, make a little uh, personal statement here, um, 
uh, now that I've done all the hard work, we're looking for a new director for the Institute for Data Science at the <laughs> University of Rochester. <laughs> and if anybody thought you might like to run an institute, uh, please get in touch with me. Or to live in Rochester. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew McCallum. I'm a professor of computer science at UMass Amherst where I do research in machine learning and natural language processing. Um, I was previously vice president of research and development at a 170 person startup company, so like multiple others here at the table, I've experienced some of both academia, um, industry, and other things in between. Um, and I'm also the, the founding director of the Center for Data Science at UMass um, Amherst, which started in 2015. So I think of us as, a, in a way, a younger sibling to the Columbia Institute here. Um, you know, we've tripled the size of our, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, we've you know, tripled the size of our master's program and doubled the number of data science courses that we're teaching and are very fortunate to have 15 tenure track faculty lines, uh, new lines in just computer science alone. Um, I'm also uh, now very happy to be stepping down after my four years of service as the president of the society that runs, I'm oh, sorry, not, not actually of, of the center, I'm, I'm gonna continue doing it for a while, but of uh, president of the society that runs the International Conference on Machine Learning. Uh, um, it was a, a whirlwind, a wild tour during that time, during which our, you know, our, our, our registration uh, you know, almost went up by an order of magnitude. And uh, um, um, yeah, so that's, that's been very exciting. So with all this extra new time, I've been having you know, various uh, you know, fun doing some new things, like trying to climb all the 48, all 48 of the 4,000 footers in the White oh Mountains my with my 16-year-old wow. son. And <laughs> I just spent two weeks uh, with, the, uh, with the monks uh, on Mount Athos at the 1,000-year-old monastery, Greek Orthodox monastery there, which maybe actually both of these are, are reasons for my little more yeah. bushy beard lately to stay warm in the snow and in the mountains, as well as uh, inspiration by the monks whose beards tend to come down to their hearts. But anyway, um, but I nonetheless am, uh, Busy also with uh, um, you know re re uh, research. Um, I have twelve PhD students, and just to give you some just short uh, um, uh, view here on a late, late uh, re recent line of research, we've been building knowledge bases like like Google's knowledge graph, but of scientific entities um, by mining the full text of the scientific literature, and been looking at knowledge graphs that instead of having symbols on their nodes and edges, instead have vector embeddings that come from deep learning, and asking ourselves the question you know after decades of study by philosophy and computer science about what does it mean to do logic on symbols, asking ourselves, what, is it, what would it mean to do logic on vectors instead? And having a lot of research fun with that. That sounds really interesting, Andrew. I'm Jeanette Wing. I'm the Avanesians Director of the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. I just joined Columbia last July, and I want to thank Kathy McEwen for setting up this institute in the past six years already. Um, and, and, and handing me uh, a robust, vibrant institute at Columbia University. Before joining Columbia, I was corporate vice president at Microsoft Research. I ran the basic research labs for Microsoft worldwide. Um, before joining Microsoft, I was at Carnegie Mellon University where I basically grew up professionally. I had officially I've uh, been on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon for, I hate, I'm embarrassed to say, 30 years. Um, during my tenure at Carnegie Mellon, I was department head twice, and in between my stints as department head, I was at the National Science Foundation, where I was the assistant director for computer and information science and engineering. So I have worn industry, academia, and government hats, and I perhaps have a a very um, unique perspective on uh, computer science and data science and technology more generally. I should say that Alfred and I go back to Carnegie Mellon, so uh, we are, um, we are we, he helped recruit me to Carnegie Mellon, I should say, um, and so I feel She was like letting that. you know I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, excuse me. Well done. <laughs> I guess I like to embarrass people. Uh, and I, I guess Henry has taken over from a, a, a chair that, chairmanship that I had at one point, which is the AAAS Section T. Um, one, of the, one of the current interests in, in Section T right now, and it, for AAAS I mean more generally, is um, the whole notion of Im the importance of using paper ballots for uh, digital elections. And I just thought I would raise that topic uh, here today because in fact there's a panel on Thursday here at Columbia University on election hacking. Uh, so I thought I would just uh, put in a little plug for that. 
Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say is actually to put in a plug for data science at Columbia University. Uh, yesterday, I led the first ever Data Science Academic Leadership Summit here at Columbia, inviting all the directors of centers and institutes and programs um, at, at many universities around the United States to come together and share best practices and talk about many of the challenges that we, we face um, and how we're overcoming those challenges. Um, the, the primary point being that data science is inherently interdisciplinary, if not multidisciplinary, and here we are trying to uh, create and nurture these institutes and centers and programs in academic institutions that have grown up traditionally respecting and reinforcing disciplinary boundaries. So uh, we had a great meeting that was yesterday. Today is the Northeast Big Data Hub meeting. Again, another data science uh, showcase for Columbia and for the whole Northeast region. Uh, and then tomorrow is the big day. Uh, that's Data Science Day at Columbia University. And I hope all of you know that you're welcome to attend, um, if, if, if assuming there's still seats in the, uh, for, for registrants, registrants. So that's, uh, that's who I am. Okay, so um, thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, as you can see, we have a great group of panelists. So um, I'm going to start off with questions to um, the panelists, and I will be asking questions to individuals so they won't all answer each question. And then uh, at the end, we'll leave time for all of you to ask questions. So um, in thinking about uh, the problems that have recently surfaced um, in, in the news, uh, we've seen um, issues around uh, civil discourse online. Um, we've seen raise the topic of uh, whether our machine learning algorithms introduce bias into the results. Um, and we've seen issues with uh, data privacy um, in unexpected ways. So I'm going to start off with questions to our panelists which uh, touch on, on those issues. Um, I'll start off with Henry. Uh, so Henry, I know you've been interested in the issue of identifying hate speech in social media. So. Um, can you tell us a little bit what is the role that AI plays in this and why is this a hard problem? Right, well, so many uh, governments, uh, private companies, nonprofits are all working on the problem of identifying hate speech and potentially uh, blocking hate speech on the internet. We've seen that hate speech can uh, lead to not only hurt feelings, but it can lead to people um, being dead and, and genocide. There's a lot of evidence that online hate speech has been implicated in, in actual uh, uh, genocides going around the world. So this immediately raises the problem, though, of who decides um, what is hate speech and what is just uh, free speech. There is no one-size-fits-all definition. Um, even though you can look up like the legal definition of hate speech, for example, by the uh, European Union, uh, most people would agree that disparaging um, an ethnic minority is, is a kind of uh, hate speech. Um, what about insulting the president? Certainly not a hate speech crime in this country, but there are countries uh, where you go to jail for that. Um, what about calling for people with disabilities to be put to death? That would seem to be a no-brainer. But then what if that were applied uh, to say that a, someone writing about expanding neonatal testing for uh, genetic uh, uh, problems is, is uh, a kind of hate speech because you're calling for the death of, uh, of, of uh, you know, embryos with uh, genetic um, errors. Uh, furthermore, even countries that are liberal democracies, the U.S. and Europe, have different standards. Uh, therefore, we thought, well, let's just start by gathering some data and uh, to create a taxonomy of what we'll call uncivil discourse. And we won't be the ones to try to draw the line. But in that taxonomy, there can be places where the laws of different uh, countries would come into play. So we've joined with Crowdflower.io 
um, which is a, a company that does work uh, similar to Mechanical Turk, and five other universities to uh, develop, develop this taxonomy of uncivil discourse and put together a large uh, corpi um, that's been tagged in detail, both with the, the, the target of the hate speech or the target of the speech, uh, the, the degree of the speech, the manner of the speech, and, and so on. And we've gathered, uh, we're starting with data that we've gathered from uh, social media, uh, news articles, and the area, uh, one collection I find particularly fascinating myself is, is comments on news articles. So um, if you think that uh, some uh, website that's full of fake news, you think it's, you know, might be full of hate speech, you've not seen nothing until you've read the comments. Uh, and then you start to understand how different communities uh, think about that. So I said there's, there's uh, no solution, but right now, the, I think the problem is, is we have, uh, because this is such an important uh, problem, uh, people have come up with particular hate speech detectors, and nobody knows what they've been trained on. They don't work particularly uh, well, so we have to be more transparent about the whole process. Okay, thanks. Um, Guru, uh, you're working in the area of health. Um, and you've talked a little bit before about the problem of algorithmic bias in data science for health. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I got to say the uh, talk by Karina was just um, uh, so good and opened a lot of fundamental issues about the um, nature of truth, right, in, 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 in general data and knowledge. Um, I want to kind of maybe take that lens and, and look at the data and knowledge we have in science, biology in particular, which is what we depend on and, and in a lot of the analysis that we do in, um, um, in, in businesses like ours, and actually in the he whole health and uh, wellness type of industry. Um, so the first observation that I have is that in in the biotech and, and biology uh, industries, ground truth is a very difficult thing to uh, to arrive at, um, just because of the nature of science, which is that you know it's evolving. I mean, it's a very very complex system that we're dealing with, and we end up focusing on different aspects of this very complex system that is inherently going to give us some amount of bias. You know, it's based on what is the hot thing that everybody is going after. It's based on where funding is available. So the, the data is inherently biased towards what is considered interesting by the community of scientists. In fact, in my, in my current job, I, I keep thinking about the fact that in science, we place a lot of emphasis on correctness which is what we try to address through peer review processes and um, you know, other kinds of validation of uh, data and, and knowledge that we get in scientific publications, but we don't place emphasis on bias. Um, and you know, let me give you one or two examples of bias maybe uh, that, that I worry about. Actually, let me start with something that is very commonly seen in many of the uh, more recent supervised machine learning type approaches, right? You think about um, you know, tumor detection or one of the more common kinds of sort of image uh, recognition types of um, uh, applications. The data that is used in those kinds of applications could end up being biased towards certain conditions um, that's available in the literature or that's available in a particular data set that somebody went after and so more often than not, your, your you know, algorithm might end up identifying a particular condition just because it was trained to, to recognize that particular condition uh, in a very complex space that we don't very well understand. So the idea of validating your results across many other kinds of closely related or known other conditions, I think needs to have a lot more um, emphasis in, in these kinds of sciences. In, in my day-to-day -day, um, current work, we go into the omics area, as you know, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and in these fields, these are very highly um, you know, emerging or fast-moving kinds of fields where um, the amount of data that's available is um, 
limited but expanding very dramatically. Um, and what I see and what I worry about in our analysis is, you know, are we too focused on the things that, you know, the literature that we saw or the data sets that we saw are pushing us towards? Um, but we are now taking great care to ensure that, um, you know, we look at many adjacencies uh, before we, we come to conclusions, right? So those kinds of validation techniques, I think, have to become much more inherent. And I would say um, in, in review processes for sciences, I think we need to start incorporating, you know, bias detection and, and bias, at least, um, you know, uh, awareness mm -hmm. um, in, in, our, in our scientific method. So I want to ask a follow-up question to you. Do you find, do you do collaboration with academia, and do you find it useful? Um, absolutely. I um, actually it turns out um, Andrew is 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 a collaborator in my in my current job. Um, so that's already an example of academic collaboration. But I've I've done that over the course of my career in all of these sort of deep advanced sciences. The um, you know, the, the, the motivation for that is kind of obvious, right? We need, in these, in these cutting edge fields, we absolutely need as many ideas as we can get, and we need to get as much knowledge out there from the latest research, so that's, that's an obvious reason for doing academic collaborations. But I think there's also, in the big data community, there's also a couple of other really strong reasons for, for doing this, and, and, and as a result, I'm doing quite a bit of that as well. One is just the availability of big data in, in these advanced fields is um, very patchy and um, generally gets concentrated in certain fields where the technology exists to, to e extract and collect the big data. As an example, in my current company, Viome, we have the technology um, that is an order of magnitude cheaper to collect omics data, uh, speci specifically transcriptomics data, and I welcome um, academics to collaborate with us to do their own research in the in the medical field or in the in the wellness field. If they are going after a st standard sort of a lab, it could cost thousands of dollars to get one sample process from a transcriptomic standpoint. Whereas if you come to a consumer-oriented business like ours, it could be an order of magnitude cheaper. So those are all good reasons why we need to have uh, collaborations across academia and industry and in my in my uh, IBM career also we built a tremendous network of academic collaborators that have made the fastest or helped us make the fastest progress in the science behind this these kinds of fields okay great um, so turning to Jeanette um, and thinking of some of the issues with uh, privacy in data. Um, given your role where you've spent um, substantial time in both academia and industry, um, have you seen uh, what are best practices that industry could borrow from academia, particularly pertaining to these kinds of questions? So it's not like Kathy and I didn't talk about this before, but yes. Um, first of all, I do want to emphasize the importance of academic and academia and industry partnering. Both need each other to advance any state of the art. And in fact, I would throw in the government uh, sector as well. I, I, I like to talk about the government academia industry ecosystem in terms especially of how uh, information technology as a sector has advanced and ra uh, so rapidly in the past few years. Um, if you remove any one, one of those pillars, uh, we would not be where we are. Um, and in terms of academia industry collaboration, I think I, I just want to uh, emphasize the usual ways in which industry likes to uh, collaborate with academia um, is, is because as uh, was mentioned, it's about talent and it's about ideas, and uh, industry always needs to be on top of what academia is doing. And I always feel that it's academia's responsibility to look beyond the horizon, to be inventing new ideas and to um, be uh, building prototypes that can then be used by industry to scale and so on. And vice versa, um, academia today, especially in data science and AI, machine learning, especially needs industry in that industry has the data and industry has the compute. Um, and I have uh, worried when I was at Microsoft that academia was falling behind. Um, and um, now let me get to Kathy's question, which is, is there something industry can learn from academia? 
And there's one example I want to give that I think is quite relevant to this question of uh, data privacy um, and ethics and so on. And I draw from my experience at Microsoft um, where a few years ago, many of you might remember in 2014, there was a paper that was published by uh, Facebook and Cornell. How many people remember this paper? Okay, well, let me tell you, the paper was, uh, it, it made uh, New York Times headlines because it basically said the article that was published um, basically uh, explained an experiment that was done with Facebook users on manipulating their emotional state based on what they were shown. Um, and of course, you can imagine the uproar and you can imagine the reaction of the press um, because just look at last week, the, re the uproar and the reaction of the press. So this caused great consternation um, in both Facebook, at both Facebook and Cornell, uh, specifically in terms of, well, was there ever an IRB process uh, followed, uh, you know, specifically did those Cornell professors follow an IRB because, uh, you know, you're, you're supposed to follow an IRB t if you're going to do human subjects, uh, exper experiments on human subjects. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but when, you know, we uh, on the sidelines, if you will, Microsoft was watching this controversy. Facebook had just created an AI research lab. We were all rooting for it because we wanted another basic research lab in industry. And what we were afraid of is kind of what happened, which, would f which was Facebook started telling their people you can't publish anymore and, and so on and so forth. But what happened within Microsoft I think is quite telling. We immediately said, okay, we at Microsoft are not subject to an IRB process in the way the universities are. So universities that re receive government funding and then do research on human subjects, uh, the researchers have to go through this IRB process. But in companies, you don't have to do this. You don't get government funding and you don't have to follow any kind of IRB process. You can do what you want. However, you know, um, at Microsoft, we recognize that even though we could do what we want, that's not the right thing. So we defined internally an <coughs> IRB process. Um, and we, we, we basically borrowed directly from what academics are subject to and how government had set this up. Now, let me make an, an additional point here. The current IRB process was defined, I, I don't know, decades ago specifically for doing research in uh, medicine. It's not necessarily the appropriate uh, or applicable IRB process for doing research on data about people. Oh, that's one thing that we recognize and we, so, uh, uh, we, we within Microsoft adapted the IRB process to take actually not only into consideration data privacy but also ethical issues. Um, so we defined that. Moreover, we went the next step, which is we contacted our colleagues at Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple, and we said, you know, don't you want to do this too? Because it would probably be a good thing for you as well. Um, so that actually led to what Eric Horvitz um, helped uh, create uh, a, 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 the partnership in AI, um, which. Uh, uh, had original founders, the, the name, the Google, Google Deep Mind, uh, Facebook, um, uh, IBM, um, Microsoft, uh, and I'm probably for, I, I think Amazon was there and then Apple joined later. That is right. um, and one of the tenants was really to look out for the privacy of uh, individuals, customer privacy, and also ethical use of, of people's data. <laughs> Um, I want to just close the story by saying even though you have these internal processes like at a university an IRB process that the government in, uh, mandates of us but also within a company, things can still go wrong. And I think that the most telling example of that was when Microsoft um, created this chat bot called Tay. How many of you are familiar with <laughs> Tay? Okay, a little, a few more. So some of you do read the, the New York Times. <laughs> um, Tay was this um, edgy, you know, 17-year-old chatbot that we wanted to, um, you know, uh, release to the world so that we could have, you know, people just engage with it and talk to it. And 
we were doing, obviously, research in NLP and con uh, dialogue and conversational agents and so on and so forth. Um, within 24 hours, we had to shut Tay down. Uh, and that is because the internet trolls took it over, or took her over, and made her repeat hate speech and other completely inappropriate remarks um, based on Twitter feeds and so on. So we, and yes, Tay went through this review process, but even so, we can still, you know, these processes can still miss these sorts of threats. Um, so that was a hard lesson learned, um, and it, it goes to show that it's just not easy, uh, this, this whole area of uh, um, social media and digital platforms and publishing content and so on. It's not easy. And I think Corina may reemphasize that this morning. Okay, thanks. Um, Alfred. Uh, what data do you use in finance, and how do you think about the issues involving its use? Sure. Uh, so Two Sigma stores roughly a petabyte of data a month from many data streams. So we get data on stock prices, you know, very frequently, tick data that's referred to. We get sort of sentiment data from people that buy and sell stock to understand is there momentum behind something. We get data which is traditional fundamental data f on corporations and other related activities, uh, you know, information about natural resources and such things. Uh, we also get data from uh, the economic world about maybe uh, some product is doing extremely well and we have information that enables us to take that and, and decide what industries may benefit from that, which may further change the expectation of valuation for that. Um, similarly, in insurance, there are the same kinds of things. A, a distance, a height of just a foot or two makes a huge difference uh, in understanding uh, the risk of flooding of some place. And uh, there are many more things in understanding uh, how well a proprietor of a shop will do at reducing the risk of food poisoning or slippage or any other kinds of things. So you have a huge amount of data on the one hand. Now, the thing about us, and I think actually it's kind of an interesting um, topic to bring up, is that we're a regulated industry in many cases in, in different ways. Insurance is regulated by state. Of course, the SEC regulates a lot of what we do in the investment world. We're working with real money um, and, and laws. So these are, this is not a interesting use of data science. Advertising was kind of an interesting use of data science, right? You look at a bunch of things and you put up an ad next to some search results. It's a good ad, great. If it's not a good ad, so what, right? It's not a really big deal. There's an immense amount of stuff you can go do in that where it's okay, actually. And this isn't to say that the Googles and Microsofts and Facebooks and the world aren't very clever. It's really an incredibly interesting area of work to do a good job with that. But the stakes, frankly, in terms of errors and such things are relatively low. It was very little regulation, et cetera, et cetera. In our world, like in healthcare, and frankly, every place that we're now trying to go in data science, the stakes are really high. So it's one thing to have a Twitter feed where you say, hey, just went to a concert, it was great. And it's another thing to have bots tweeting things by region with the particular expectation of electing a political candidate based upon the known views of some subset of the population. One thing is perfectly fine and the other is we have a lot of issues. So what I think what we find at Two Sigma, and I think you will find that in most of the modern areas of the application of data science, is it gets a lot harder. Now, and again, well, I'll refer to Corinna's fine talk. It illustrates that with trying to understand any aspects moving towards truth and understanding of information. Um, in fact, I think we have to be very careful. The size of this program, the growth of NIPS, et cetera, to me, as, as a, an aged person, as uh, Jeanette mentioned, uh, it means we're sort of in, at the peak of inflated expectations with respect to uh, big data and 
how easy everything is going to be. That's a Gartner Group term. There was this, at least that's how I learned it when I was in the business world at IBM, that everyone hypes everything for a long time. The whole world decides that is the solution uh, to self-driving cars and you name it. Uh, and in fact, I think then what often happens is that there's a excessive correction and we get into a, a trough of disillusionment, which happens next. And then of course things settle somewhere in the middle I think we're getting near that peak of, of inflated expectations. So what does that mean at, at Two Sigma? And what do I think the implications are broadly? Well, we have to realize that in data science, there are many, many problems that we always have to evaluate before doing anything. Um, there's, there's, and I give a talk on this. I refer to a talk I gave last year at Data Science Day called The Opportunities and Perils of Data Science. Uh, you'll find it on the web if you search for those words, opportunities and perils of data science. There, there are many challenges, and they range from technical challenges of whether the systems can, are interpretable. Do these large matrices that we have guiding neural networks, are they interpretable? Can we understand what they're doing and hence fix them if they're problematic, et cetera? Do we understand how to do work around getting at causality? So many of the problems in healthcare are association studies that actually were, are probably completely screwed up in terms of the advice that they would give to people. And it's extremely difficult with data science, not impossible, a lot of work in it, to go and look at causality in these systems. Um, you look at issues of ownership. Uh, we look at issues of, I, I talked uh, a lot about resilience. If we optimize the hell out of everything, don't we make systems less resilient because we're operating near their theoretical maxima and we don't know what's happening. That's a big issue in financial markets. So if all of us are applying data science in certain ways towards the optimization of portfolio value, does that create systemic risk? There are places where I think about that a lot and where I think we're actually doing things to lessen systemic risk by the kinds of things that we're doing, but you have to consider, consider that. Um, I think, um, just I'll go through, through one more, um, and that, uh, that that's clearly around bad data. So uh, we've seen that in the political space, right? That if you have bad data that a lot of people are influenced, we, we can do what we can to try to convince people that the data is suspect and that's a great goal of, of the fact check sites. Uh, but what about in finance? What if you're building high speed systems that are looking at data elements and then they're being fed bad data uh, will they do really uh, stupid things? Now, some of that would be probably illegal under regulatory structures, uh, but some of it probably is not. So fascinating issues. We have to deal with the breadth of these issues as we look at uh, trying to use data and artificial intelligence and machine learning and optimizing, uh, and optimizing financial outcomes. Okay, thanks. Um, Andrew, so uh, you're working with scientific journal articles <clears throat> which is uh, a quite different kind of online data, but nonetheless, it is now online and available for people to use. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what you can do with it, and does algorithmic bias play a role in, in what you can do? Absolutely. So we all know the volume of tweets and other social media have exploded uh, dramatically. It's also the case with the scientific literature. For example, in biomedicine alone, there are 4,000 new research articles published every day. And so it's really hard for scientists to stay on top of even their own subfields, much less understand the landscape of fields that abut their own, and uh, you know, which, which you know, and it's those abut from those abutting fields that new collaborative opportunities that are going to be lead, new breakthroughs are going to come. Um, and you know, it's. Uh, no. Obviously, for the world to solve its most important problems in you know, food, water, energy, uh, um, you know, in many other places, we need these scientific advances. And so if we can make scientists more, more efficient, then uh, that will lead to a lot of good, uh, uh, um, good outcomes. Um, so there are a lot of people in the no Northeast, actually, who, uh, you know, who are connected with the hub, um, who are doing research in trying to leverage the scientific literature to accelerate the progress of science. Um, David Bly here at Columbia has a project with John Lafferty, who's now at uh, Yale, on extracting equations from scientific articles and understanding them at a semantic level, independent of the particular notation being used, in order to find linkages between different areas of, uh, of various mathematical fields. 
um, Laszlo Barabasi, who's at Northeastern, um, is studying, you know, he studies the science of networks generally, but has especially been studying um, networks of, of scientists and of their papers and citations and networks of ideas, and has just an amazing collection of interesting descriptive statistics. Things like small teams are more, uh, um, are more correlated with making uh, major creative leaps in science, whereas larger teams tend to just flesh out old ideas. Um, and Finale Doshi, who's at Harvard, she's been studying both clinical notes and literature, as well as what's said in, uh, in chat rooms in which people are uh, discussing health. Um, at UMass, uh, I have a number of projects in this area. One of them is a collaboration with MIT Material Science, in which we are gathering hundreds of thousands of research articles in material science, extracting from the full text of those articles the structured recipes, essentially, that are a new material synthesis uh, um, um, uh, um, a method, um, and also extracting the the properties of the resulting materials from cooking up a new batch of this uh, car battery material. Um, um, building of this a very large database of these by automated extraction and then mining this database to find patterns to suggest brand new recipes that have never been tried before to the yield hopefully a better car battery material of the future. Um, we're also fortunate recently to have a substantial amount of funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to build basically a knowledge base of science. So I think about the Google knowledge graph which tells us about movie actors and countries and politicians and things like that. This is a knowledge graph of scientific entities of materials and chemicals and proteins and diseases and, and genes and equipment and, uh, um, and the tasks and how they're all related to each other um, to build tools for scientists uh, um, broadly based that would help them, again, navigate through their own field and neighboring fields. Uh, um, um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're very excited about this. And it's in this context, actually, that we're doing a lot of this sort of logical reasoning with the tools of deep learning um, uh, all together to help actually infer new relations that aren't ex stated explicitly in the text but could be inferred from, um, from other evidence. Um, and then and the lastly, moving before moving on to fairness and transparency, um, I think a key part of the progress of science is how we do scientific peer review, right? That's really our heartbeat. And, um, and so much of how scientific peer review is done now was really designed in the days when papers were printed on paper and sent through the post, and it's really quite inefficient. And so, um, uh, you know, Jan LeCun, who I've known for, uh, for many decades, uh, um, and I both have radical thoughts about how scientific peer review should be revolutionized. Um, so we're advocating separating the publishing of papers, because that's now incredibly cheap just to put uh, you know, articles online, separating that from the evaluation of these papers, um, whereby there, you know, we really should be able to create an environment in which multiple reviewing entities can put their stamps of approval um, uh, on a paper. It's not that a paper is exclusively, say, a nature paper or a science paper, um, that the traditional reviewing entities like Nature and Science and other journals can have their stamps of approval, but there can also be these formal reviewing entities like uh, um, you know the hundred PhD students at UMass who focus on machine learning who've, who who have formed their own little reviewing entity they put stamps of approval out it gives them a degree of anonymity uh, anonymity to uh, um, uh, um, you know, avoid concerns about being uh, you know dinged by more senior members of the community and uh, and who knows maybe some whippersnapper reviewing entity like this may build a reputation that people decide is more useful than some stodgy old journal um, so we are, we've uh, you know, been experimenting with open peer review in which the reviews happen. Uh, um, the reviews are essentially public from the, throughout the reviewing process. And this, um, you know, we've built a website that's been used by the International Conference on Learning Representations, one of the hottest new places that deep learning research is happening, in which we worked with social scientists um, to survey the field of authors and reviewers to ask them how they felt about this more open review process process in which they said they felt like the reviews were more fair, that they were more high quality, that it would lead to, uh, um, uh, um, to higher degrees of collaboration. And so, yeah, I mean, I feel like more sunshine in the, uh, in the, in the review process will do everyone a lot of good. So, you know, if, lastly, if I have a moment or maybe I'm out of time to talk about fairness and transparency, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll wait for your ding to, uh, to, um, to, to let me stop. Um, yeah. we, we do need to begin to wrap up, and all right. I do so, wanna, but I do want to ask you one other question. All right. Well, I'll let, leave it as your choice whether you'd like me to talk about fairness and transparency or another question. So I want to ask one other question that's related to the panel, which has to do about collaboration between industry and academia. And can you say something from the academia? 
<clears throat> the academic side about what are yeah. the challenges or the benefits in, in working with industry. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kathy. Well, I think, sort of agreeing with what Jeanette was saying earlier, I, I, it's good to remember that, you know, we all need each other and that we exist in the same ecosystem, um, that we are each other's producers and consumers, and, uh, and yet, in a way, you know, we're, we're like different nationalities, and so it takes you know, some time and some patience and a little humility to understand each other. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that you know, these are key ingredients for getting some success. And I've seen success take lots of different forms. So um, you know, for example, at UMass, through our industrial affiliate program, uh, we made contact with a small local startup company, and you know, they didn't have a lot of funding to give us, but that's, that's okay. They, they started to work with us in an industry mentorship course that we run, in which um, you know, groups of master's students will form a team that, that's then mentored by an industry a uh, PhD level person from industry and you know they ended up running a great team and they ended up hiring a student out of this and it was just a you know a perfect um, a, you know delightful outcome for them in which you know, we didn't just arrive on their doorstep and start asking for a big uh, research funding um, you know another example of maybe uh, three examples I'll give um, Pratt & Whitney had been working with, uh, had been trying to work with some other university that effectively was not really listening to them, right? It was kind of taking their money and doing what they wanted. And, uh, um, you know, they, you know, they came to, uh, to UMass for a second try and, um, uh, and I guess, you know, we're, you know, we were fortunate, I guess, to just to have connected them to some faculty that just were ready to listen a little bit more carefully to better understand their needs. and. And those were both research needs as well as needs having to do with um, you know, private and proprietary data th uh, um, that they had. And you know, we're in the process of exploring with them now um, uh, that uh, you know, rather than trying to run our very sophisticated machine learning methods on their underpowered hardware, we'd like to run it on our um, university hardware, which actually we were very fortunate had given a grant from the state of Massachusetts to have, um, we're about to have actually 800 GPU machines. I think it's actually, I was comparing notes with Jan LeCun, it's the largest uh, um, you know, uh, that we're aware of a uh, collection of deep learning supporting hardware of any academic institution in uh, North America. Um, and, um, um, you know, you know, basically, we're offering to set up on our own dime a uh, you know a cloistered, uh, um, secure um, subset of our of our network in which they would be willing to put their private data. And so it required a little bit of like some generosity and outreach on our part to do something for them, um, uh, you know, for free effectively in order to make the relationship work. And then. Lastly, um, it's the most dramatic for us. So Mass Mutual um, is an, you know, a, a national level uh, insurance company. Their headquarters are in our neighborhood. And they, you know, to their credit, um, you know, well, they're thinking about just revamping the entire company top to bottom using machine learning. And they care about building up local critical mass and about having a larger volume of students trained in data science being produced. And, and to their credit, they really stepped back and thought about this. Well, how can we best support this? And they said, well, I think the best way we could support this is by giving a $15 million donation to the Center for Data Science to help you hire more faculty so you can train more students. And uh, that was very kind of them. And uh, um, so lastly, just for challenges, I mean, I think, you know, so it takes time, right? We're all busy, both in academia and industry. We're scrambling on the latest crisis and without necessarily taking the time to step back and introspect and to listen. Um, and, uh, you know, I think just, Taking a deep breath, having a little mindfulness, thinking about each other's needs, um, and uh, um, and taking the time to find our alignments is uh, what it takes. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what others on the panel have to say on this topic. But um, we're getting, you know, near the end of time, and I want to give a chance for the audience to ask questions. So, uh, would anyone in the audience like to pose a question? So maybe while you're thinking, I will ask that question to Alfred, because I'm curious from the industry point of view what he sees as challenges and benefits. And you guys continue thinking, and then we'll come back to you, and you can pose the next question. So I've been uh, on this side of university and, uh, and industry collaboration from each perspective over the years. Um, so the, the common thing when I was head of research at Google is whenever I would visit a university, people would say, you have all the data. How can we possibly be in this world without the data? And uh, I probably talked with some of you, and you probably were not happy with me. 
is that Google was very reluctant to ever share data. Uh, there were many times we were told, well, Facebook is providing us information. Uh, Jeanette, that was happening at Cornell and other places, and, and we wouldn't do it. Uh, I promise you, I think I can promise you, that the recent uh, result of the Cambridge Analytica uh, press will make Google's attitude much more prevalent. And I don't think you can fault industry for that. Because it's, so what if, I mean, I, I, I know many faculty here and you will sign something and say, we promise to vote safe your data, et cetera. Uh, it's even, a, even if you do that and you leak it, the question is, did Facebook have a data leak? Um, and why didn't they disclose it? They, would, they might say, I don't know what they'll say, I'm not really following the details. They'll say, we didn't have a leak, we controlled the release of data to a faculty member and an app vendor and they didn't abide by their contract, that's not our fault. Well, it's I, problematic. I want to second, second what Alfred said. The minute I read about this Cambridge Analytica uh, uh, news last week, my immediate reaction it was, it's going to be even harder for academics right. to get access to so, company data. So now, what does that mean, though, and how did we do it? I think Google, and I will say Two Sigma as well, we really do, Google, Google, when I was there, we really wanted to engage with academics, and we did in all sorts of ways with, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars in faculty grants and zillions of internships and, and, uh, and visiting faculty. We did all sorts of things. At Two Sigma, we do, for our scale, I think perhaps even more uh, with faculty because we're so interested in certain machine learning, like sequence prediction, which is not the classic problem in in, uh, in, in machine learning that is done in universities, which have looked at voice or image and things like that. We are very interested in non-stationarity of distributions. A cat is a cat is a cat in image data, and that's not true in predictions of what's going on in economic activity, things, things change. So we're, we're really interested too. So you have to find ways of doing it. You're really fortunate if companies um, will actually allow you to host their computation in your cloud. I think that would be very hard to do. It's exceedingly unlikely, I think, that most companies would actually yield to a university that, that ability. It might happen, and I'm impressed if you can do that, but uh, we almost certainly wouldn't do that. Um, just the issues of debating whether Google's cloud security or Amazon's or Microsoft's are good enough, and the issue of subpoena, of whether you can be subpoenaed and we can't, and all of the regulatory issues, that would happen to us or anyone in the tech industry as well make it exceedingly complex uh, to provide information, say, to a university, uh, let alone a, a big data provider. So it, I, I think we have to be very creative as to what we do. So I think the motion of people around across institutions is really important. There's nothing like taking a packet, uh, a human packet, <laughs> And, uh, and in that uh, protoplasm or whatever we are and moving it from one place to another for six months with an internship or three months or a visiting faculty position and hosting people back and forth. We teach courses. Uh, our, my employees teach courses at a variety of places around. It's incredibly valuable for us to go do that. That's something industry should be doing. There's a shortage of faculty. Uh, so we really should be doing that. We know more about cloud computing than most university faculty members do because we do so much of it, we can teach that. And then I think it's the, the intern programs are really important when a, a faculty member student goes to Microsoft or Google or some other institution, maybe another university for the summer as well, by the way. There's an enormous amount of hybridization, I think, that occurs in that. So I think I, I would vote in favor of those kinds of things. Um, more than data transfer or expecting computation. Maybe one last comment, uh, and that is that do keep in mind if you're on the university side that they're going to be different things. So Two Sigma is not likely to collaborate in depth on a zero-sum game prediction algorithm, right? That's just not likely. Google's not going to collaborate in depth on a uh, abuse rejection algorithm in search because it just can't be public and it's, it's quite confidential. But there are enormous amounts of what everybody does where collaboration is quite feasible. And I think that's, that's true at my firm as well. Okay, so let's see again. Anyone from the audience want to ask a question now? Okay, so we have one over here. Right here, you're in the front. There's oh. one back there too. <coughs> 
My question is a little bit different in the sense, uh, if you look at the blockchain and distributed ledger technology, right, where everything is anonymous, would that, that solve the problem of uh, data privacy that what, what we are talking and how would it relate to AI? You were probably more involved in that than I was at one time, but I could talk about it too. And, and, um, I mean, sure, if you want to start, that's, Why don't you that's start cool. All right. Because um, IBM was very involved. Yes, definitely. So um, I, I think uh, the idea of blockchain, obviously, is uh, distributed, you know, some notion of consistency of data stores um, with a level of um, policy attached to each packet of data, if you want, and uh, some level of security attached to it, uh, right? That's the general idea. Um, I think in the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of instances where um, we need distributed computation in AI and machine learning. Um, for many scenarios, it's because the data itself is distributed and you cannot possibly move huge amounts of data to where the computation is, so you need to move the computation to where the data is. So in those instances, I think there is an opportunity to use some of the underlying protocols for blockchain um, in the world that, that I think regulated industries live in. Now, I, I'm not sure that the, um, um, the idea of anonymization is going to be the you know, the solution to the problems that we face, certainly in the health industry, because there's a lot of, you know, what I would call reconstruction of data that is possible. Um, even with what you think is anonymization, there's, you know, you can look at, you know, take genomics or take any omics, right? It's not that difficult to take the data that you get from somebody's biology and reconstruct it and um, and identify people. So I don't believe that that is going to be a general solution. There's a lot more that needs to be done than simply anonymization. So I don't believe blockchain is going to be the answer to that particular problem. Right, but if you look at from the, uh, something to learn from there, right? I mean, who are the most user of the blockchain? Kind of a criminals and a lot of other things that we want to do the money laundering or want to do something. So when we want to bring the anonymity to the data or privacy to the data and we want to block all those things, wouldn't that we are en encouraging those people to uh, join the force, basically? Well, I mean, so, I, th I, so, think, so I, think, I think you're suggesting that blockchain is definitely not going to be... No, but what, I, what I'm <laughs> saying that what level of data privacy regulation we put on the data that we're currently talking about, there's a downside to it. Okay. Okay. I'd like to I give actually, a, oh. uh, if I might interject here on other technologies that I'm more comfortable um, advocating in terms of data privacy, I would look to um, three different areas. One would be differential privacy, which I think is being shown to be scalable and practical. Um, there are companies that are actually use it in specific instances, and I think one should not shy away from investigating a differential privacy, and that's really basically a statistical technique to ensure um, some some formal notion of privacy. The other is uh, applied cryptographic techniques uh, like secure multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption. These are obviously have provable guarantees. They are um, being explored in terms of practicality and scalability today. There are certain specific problems that they can be used in a very practical way, and I think it's worth the academic community working with industry exploring those. Um, I th especially think that they would be useful in the healthcare scenario. And the third would be actually secure hardware techniques. Um, you know, uh, companies are coming out with um, instruction sets that allow you to build secure enclaves, and then you can actually have provable guarantees in terms of what you can see in, 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 in terms of the processing, the computation, and the data. Um, I think one of the qualms that the academic community has with blockchain is that there's been a lot of um, discussion about it and implementations of it and a lot of claims about it, the, its security. Um, but the, they're, not, they're really they're easy to poke holes at. And so that is my own 
concern. Um, I think the concept is quite elegant, but the, the reality is far from that. Okay, so I would like to get one more question in, and, and then we have to go to, um, we have some announcements, so back here. Thank you, I'll try not to be too much of a crank. Um, I'm from, uh, from industry, I've always been in industry, and a lot of what I'm doing is <clears throat> trying to access data in interesting ways to come up with novel opportunities for what might present something in, in business. Right now it has to do with insurance. And um, a lot of times I've stumbled across different kinds of you know, academic or not-for-profit, non-commercial sharing agreements. And I understand <clears throat> in a way that IRBs might be there, these are just kind of, they've persisted over time. <clears throat> in an era now where there's a lot more of a kind of availability of data and things that can be done with it, it seems in a sense maybe an antiquated measure that's in place, the notion of distinction between commercial and non-commercial use of data, um, other things <clears throat> such as, <clears throat> sorry, in, in governmental realm, uh, making public record requests and the kind of work that I might do as a startup trying to get access to things versus other parties already taking advantage of things and having data in different ways. So it's not really a, a question um, as much as there's a very different, I think, understanding of what we can do with data when we, when we really lack fundamental abilities to do things because we, we're just challenged without having it. Um, didn't quite come out the way I intended, but <laughs> the thought there is is a big distinction between those who don't and those who, who do, and what can we do to further embrace to get access, not being tied to uh, an academic community. Okay, so so. I, I, I could make one comment on that one. I think the world is going to change in the next 10 years with very large scale data aggregators providing lots of data. So just think of cloud computing, for example, right? So now we have large aggregators of zillions of cores, and they're available for a buck ninety-nine and an internet connection, right? And you can go get access to a GPU for an hour for 50 cents or whatever it costs. So I think what's gonna happen is that you will see ways in the market segments when all of this data uh, starts getting aggregated and made available uh, for a fee, perhaps 10 cents an hour, or a penny a record, or whatever it might be, a dollar, a dollar, a good idea. I don't know how they'll be charged for. Uh, and I think that's going to end up sort of democratizing in, in a certain sense, or at least making broadly available far more amounts of things. We need to do it in the scientific community. There's work going on, say, on genomic data and genomic databases, and there's complexity and privacy in that. But, but that's going on in, say, the academic and science domain. You can see it beginning to happen in the commercial space as well. A lot of startups are in that space already, and you could imagine the big companies want to be at it also. Okay, so I'm hearing that uh, we can take a few more questions. So, uh, yes, was there one over here? The blue shirt, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, so some of the picture I'm getting of the kind of industry and academy collaboration is that it's labor-intensive, a little bit perilous. Um, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing started with an industry academy collaboration. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, from the industry side and the industry perspective, what's your motivation for reaching out, for doing that work, for kind of embracing the peril of that kind of collaboration? <coughs> Um, I can get started. I mean, look, there is, there is no way that scientific discovery can happen without um, industry-academia collaboration. And the, the balance here is, you know, one of scale, right? You have economies of scale on the industry side, potentially, right? If you, if you find the right industry partner, and there is a lot of great ideas and scientific methodologies that's available on the academic side. So I'll just take an example from my uh, domain, current domain, which is um, clinical studies. There's a ton of work going on um, with many different institutions doing clinical studies, but they are probably highly um, unoptimized in terms of extracting the right kind of data and analyzing the right kind of data from, you know, think about hospitals, labs, practitioners of various kinds. Now, if those kinds of university entities um, can collaborate with industry that can optimize the collection of data, that is a win-win, I think, for, for both sides. 
So that's a very straightforward, and, and by the way, there's, there's IRB um, related processes that need to be followed, and there's all you know other regula regulatory processes that need to be followed in these kinds of collaborations. Um, and I think that's the best shot we have in order to make progress in, in certain fields. Now, I cannot say the same thing of every field, but in, in my field, that's definitely the, the driver. I think one of the other important drivers is about talent. Um, it, in, and I can't under, uh, uh, emphasize that enough in that, um, over emphasize, <laughs> emphasize it enough. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially in the IT industry today where there is still, I believe, a talent war for people who know anything about AI and specifically deep learning. Um, and it is about making your company attractive to the next generation of potential employers, employees, uh, and having good relationships with faculty um, and, uh, you know, embracing student interns in the summertime. <laughs> Um, one, one factoid, if, you, if you'll allow me, is a few years ago when I was at Microsoft Research, we did a, a survey to look at all the papers that were published by Microsoft Research. Um, many, many papers because we're talking about a thousand researchers. Eighty-five percent of those papers were co-authored yep. with academics. And this is why, you know, advancing state-of-the-art it's, it's industry and academia, at least industry research and academia working side by side. Sure. We always felt at Microsoft Research that academia was an extension of us and that we are an ex extension of academia, at least in computer science. Right, although MSR, you were particularly academic, right? Yeah, we were pretty good, so, particularly so just, academic. <laughs> I, you can make a very quick list, right? Open source is a really good collaboration tool between industry and academe. All the agreements are in place, it's clear, vast amounts of that are done. So in building tools and software and stuff and open source, easy. So a lot of, a lot of development. Um, students and, and talent, I completely agree that's probably number, number one on the list. So that's one. Open source is probably two. Three ideas. ideas. All of us need to, to, yep. to scour the world for ideas. So we read papers. Believe it or not, I'm in an institution that's thought of as a financial institute. We read papers continuously. Mm -hmm. Please send us, write good papers. We'd like to meet you. We'd like to learn the ideas quickly. We want to give you problems to solve. So if everyone in the world is improving cat recognition <laughs> from 99% to 99.5%, if that's what a lot of you are doing, I have some other problems, noisy data, <laughs> sequences, other things, you know, abuse rejection, because like, we, we don't want to like, lose lots of money. So um, finally, there's one more, I think, that, sh that should be mentioned, uh, and that's marketing. Don't underestimate how important all of you in universities are. If you use our stuff or like our stuff or are part of our work, whether at Microsoft or Google, even Two Sigma, uh, or your company, um, Biome, Biome um, then, then that's, that's great, right? We like that. We, we would love Andrew to be using some you know, knowledge representation tool that we built. That would make no, it that's an, much that's better. That's a really good point. Uh, at Microsoft, we used to call that academic mind share. Yep. Uh, so that, that's how I think of it, both ways. Okay, uh, Leah in the front. Well, at the time, Microsoft Research was about 22 years old, and so over 22 years, you do establish good working relationships with uh, top academics and their students. Um, so it was not hard to do. I think um, it is through summer internship programs. Uh, Microsoft put out faculty fellowship programs, and of course, researchers, whether you're from academia or industry, attend the same conferences. And so it was really one large research community, and it was, it was not, um, perhaps it's a surprising, the number might be surprising, but the relationships, as with any relationship, it they grow over time, and then they connect you to others, and so that's, that's how it's. A, also, when you have a thousand researchers around the world, you get quite connected to your local universities, um, and, and word spreads. Okay, we have one question here, then one over there, and then we'll end. So go ahead. Hi, I'm from a telecommunications industry, and we, fall, we are highly regulated, 
And I totally agree with Al there that, that um, the privacy, the, the customer data and privacy issue is, is so important that we have much higher internal standard than what's required of us, so internally. So here I have a challenge and question for both uh, Professor McCollum and also Professor Wynn here, that do you think it's possible to establish some sort of standard from the government sector perhaps to agree by like sort of like a NIST for the differential, differentiable privacy that there's some sort of standard that we can adhere by because it's not possible to get to 100% privacy because there's so many, it's just not possible. I, I, I can tell you from looking at all these data. But is it possible like there's a Six Sigma standard that can be, no, that can be achieved and accomplished? And, and, and in addition to many of the things that you talked about, that uh, all the evaluation for peer review and for the publication, those all can be extended to data. Right, right. I don't know about a level of optimism for, for making a standard. <laughs> I think that so many different companies have different, um, uh, different needs. I, I mean, to respond also to Al somewhat, the company that's considering giving us some of this data, so first of all, it hasn't happened quite yet, although there are active discussions that seems to be going well. I mean, it's not about people and it's not about finances, it's more about you know, maintenance of machinery and uh, uh, things like that. So I think that that, um, that helps. But I think in our experience so far, every one of these industry um, collaborators has had different requirements uh, um, for both the nature of the data as well as for its privacy. Okay. Let me speak a little, little more optimistically. Um, and I don't know that there might, uh, I, I think there, it's definitely an interesting exercise for NIST <coughs> to take up upon itself. Um, but I do know that uh, people are, um, people in government agencies, and I'm speaking specifically about the Census Bureau, are actually seriously looking at differential privacy um, not ready for 2020 because 2020 is only two years away, but maybe 2030. Um, and, and so I, I think this is actually quite modern thinking for a government agency like the Census Bureau. Um, but I, but, but the, so I, I'm a little more optimistic than Andrew. Okay, our one last question. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Okampa. I'm with the Penn Center for Learning Analytics. And since we work with education stuff, I guess that's one of my questions uh, is, it seems like a lot of the discussion we've heard today, especially around the fake news, but you know, even around some of the humanities research that was happening within Facebook that maybe wasn't acknowledged as humanities research, um, seems like maybe one of the things we could be doing rather than trying to control things is to maybe build up the public's education level on these issues so that they can be more proactive in taking care of their own privacy and be more proactive in understanding when they're being manipulated and what people are trying to do to them. And there's a lot of resistance to that, um, and, and I understand that. Um, but definitely a lot of the stuff that's built for consumers is built to be very flashy and enjoyable and has sort of short-term bad effects on their learning capabilities. And certainly an easy thing to do to fix this would be to take not your $15 million because you should have it. Um, but that would fund a lot of literature TAs. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just doing back of the envelope cal calculations uh, to help with grad, you know, have graduate students help with teaching writing, teaching critical reading skills in, in these institutions. Uh, or there might even be sneaky but, you know, altruistic things that we could be doing to sort of help people gain this understanding more implicitly through their exposure through these systems. Um, are, th are all those things top secret or are there any that you can talk about? <laughs> I guess I would ask if any of the people at academia would want to answer that. Like Henry, would you, would you want to talk to that? Or right, well, I, 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 th I think that certainly educating the public, there's a, a lot more that we could do in the university. Uh, so actually in, in one of our projects, um, uh, we're, we are uh, working with a very vulnerable population, um, uh, which includes uh, uh, people who have come to family court for orders of protection. And we're doing uh, some measurements about their, uh, sort of their level of, of mental health, anxiety, depression, and um, then they're letting us get uh, a limited amount of their, um, their Google takeout data. And 
we went through the whole IRB process and, and you know, with all the protections, we finally got the study approved. But then one thing we, we realized is um, we're not actually providing a benefit to these, these end users. So we said, well, you know, if we're sitting down with these people for, for 30 minutes, um, maybe we could also teach them about how to protect their privacy, how to change their passwords, how to stop like abusive family members from cyber stalking them and, and, and so on. So we're, 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 we're moving ahead with that. Uh, but I think, you know, more, more broadly, uh, we don't have, we could leverage probably like an army of, of both uh, graduate students, but also undergraduate students uh, to, to go out into the community uh, to, to help uh, educate people about some of these issues. I can make a brief comment if you like. Go ahead, Andrew. So I think that undergraduate education on these issues is tremendously uh, important. And just as at many universities, there's say a science breath requirement that all, you know, all undergraduates are taking a, you know, some science class. Um, at UMass, we're exploring issues that maybe there should be a, um, a breadth requirement for computational thinking, which is actually a term coined by Jeanette here. Uh, um, and, the, and furthermore, that yes, data- Yes, should be. Yes, I agree, <laughs> that's right. And, and the furthermore, data science specifically could be a great platform for that kind of computational thinking. Uh, um, and. Uh, and we at UMass, as well as a number of other universities, are actively building zero prerequisite freshman level data science classes for which, um, you know, not only a little bit of um, computational thinking and the programming and the data, but also these uh, kinds of both ethic issues uh, as well as uh, um, you know, fairness and, uh, and uh, skepticism issues would be part of the curriculum. Okay, so with that, we need to end. Let's thank the panel.